There's a very interesting electricity story happening south of the border. Now, everyone knows that U.S. President Donald Trump doesn't like renewables, and neither does the Energy Secretary Chris Wright, who comes from the oil and gas sector. Right? You'd see Wright all the time putting out press releases and tweeting about you know, how unreliable renewables are, so on. But the Americans have got a problem. For about 15 years after uh, 20, 2008, uh, load growth on the power grids was literally flat. There had been so many manufacturing plants and so on go out of <clears throat> go out of business that uh, there was no load growth. And so when load growth started again a couple of years ago, some of the utilities were kind of caught flat-footed. But now it gets really bad because with the addition of uh, AI data centers, uh, electrification of businesses and homes, and electric vehicles. All of those are increasing demand. Depends on who you talk to, but somewhere in the 3 to 5% range per year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. In the power business, uh, that's really going to put a huge strain on American power grids. And there's lots of utilities who are, who, you know, who are wondering how they're going to, to uh, meet the demand. And but <clears throat> so uh, here's the story. And I'll explain all this in a moment. Uh, while Trump may hate wind and solar and batteries, last year they accounted for 93% of all U.S. power generation capacity additions. So not hydro, not nuclear, not gas, was wind, solar, and batteries, 93%. Same is forecast for this year. And we'll, in fact, we'll probably see uh, I would suspect even a little higher percentage. So despite all of the high, you know, high level uh, attention being paid to the changes in policy, US President Donald Trump ha actually hasn't had that much of a, an impact so far. Now we'll see because some of the changes he made to the Inflation Reduction Act, particularly that affect solar and the subsidies and tax credits uh, don't take effect until 2027. So there's a big rush to get in under the wire, uh, and that has something to do with the with the current uh, spate of projects. And but but I would suspect that it's also going to continue after 2027 because American utilities have no choice. So let me explain. So what option if if demand is going to grow three to five percent a year? What options do utilities have? Okay, let's go through them. Natural gas would be a would be a no brainer. You think? I mean, the the U.S. is just drowning in gas. Prices are low, and despite the fact that you know LNG uh, plants are expanding, exports are expanding, lots of capacity coming on over the next year or two. Still, I mean, there's a lot of gas coming out of the Permian Basin and other basins. It's lots of gas. The problem is not the fuel; it's the turbines, the combined cycle turbines. Uh, if you order one today, you might get one in 2030, 2031. Now, a number of the manufacturers are uh, adding manufacturing capacity uh, to meet that demand, but they have to build the plants and, and they still, you know, there's a lot of speculation that even that won't meet demand, that there'll still be a backlog of about five years. So you can't add, even if you wanted to, you couldn't add much gas. In fact, last year it was only 7%. Gas made up 7% of the new uh, generation capacity additions. Nuclear. Well, you know, there's a lot of buzz around small modular reactors. The problem is we don't have any. Uh, Ontario Power and Generation will have the first one in North America, maybe 2028, 20, 2029. 20, and they're using Hitachi technology. So we'll see if that works and we'll see if there are budget overruns, uh, if there are uh, schedule uh, overruns, uh, what the cost of, of electricity will be, all unknown at this point in the game. So it's not like you can count on, on nukes uh, for a lot of capacity, particularly in the short term, not even out maybe to 2040. Hydro, same kind of problem. These are big mega projects. You don't have a lot of opportunity to, you know, uh, to add additional capacity, take a long time to plan and approve and, and build.
So they're not going to be a, a solution in the short term. Coal. Everybody hates coal. Even the utilities hate coal. Part of it is because the U.S. Uh, coal fleet is very old. I mean, it really should be retired or replaced if they were going to continue with coal. But nobody really sees a future for it. So as these plants reach the end of their working lives, the utilities would just as soon shut them down. So there's no appetite for increasing coal. The, the U.S. Department of Energy under Wright has issued some orders uh, staying the closure of some of some coal plants. So that that might happen, uh, you know, extend their life a, a few years. But it's not a solution to the problem. There's no way that coal can contribute much to meeting the 3 to 5 percent demand increase. And that leaves us with wind, solar, and batteries. So, you know, the, the, the problem here is not that, um, uh, they, that utilities want to do this. They have to do it. And uh, I sit on the U.S. Energy Association's journalism panel during their monthly technical briefings uh, sometimes, and they always have U.S. Uh, elect uh, utility executives, uh, you know, on the expert panel. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen vice presidents of utility sweat bullets when they're talking about how, look, we have to, you know, we have to close down these thermal plants, whether it's coal or or gas, and we have nothing to replace them with. And then we have all this growth, and we just don't know where we're going to what we're going to do. And so, here I want to give you some of the numbers of where we're going and what might happen. Uh, so last year, ninety three wind solar battery took ninety three percent. Well, this year, the forecast at utility scale is about the same. The same 58 gigawatts of, of new capacity and wind, solar, and battery will be about 90, about 93%. Ironically, that's the same percentage at the global level for wind, solar, and battery. Who would have guessed? That's not the narrative. That's not what you see in news stories, but that's what the data says. But here's, there's a little wrinkle in here uh, that doesn't play a big role at this point, but I think it's going to going forward. And that's small scale rooftop. Now we've seen in places like Texas and, and California where there's a lot of that rooftop solar added. In fact, you know, they had to, in California, they had to cut back on the, on the fee that, or the, the, the price that rooftop uh, solar owners got uh, when they fed electricity back in, into the system because there was just so much of it. But nevertheless, last year they added eight gigawatts. So eight at the rooftop scale and 53, uh, sorry, 58 at the, um, at the utility scale. But here's where this is going. And you see this in the global south. Uh, Pakistan is, is sort of the flavor of the month. So we'll use that as an example. They have a very unreliable grid and uh, ch cheap Chinese solar panels flooded into the country. I think last year it was like $1.6, $1.8 billion worth. And suddenly they were popping up on roofs all over the place, being put on balconies, just wherever, you know, people, if they could afford it, where they, where they bought panels and suddenly they had electricity. And there was so much of that uh, rooftop solar added that the actual load on the power grid fell by 9%. So the rooftop solar everywhere is becoming a bigger and bigger part of it. Oh, and I should mention, that China, which is installing, you know, like 60% of the, the world's uh, solar capacity, half of that is actually rooftop. And a lot of it is industrial. It's partly state policy and it's partly uh, businesses, uh, you know, industries that want to self-generate, store it in a battery, and then they can feed into the grid when they want. They can arbitrage, it's, you know, it's, it's called sell it back when prices are high. Um, or when the, if the grid goes down, if there are brownouts or blackouts, they're protected. So they really see it as kind of an insurance policy and as an opportunity to make a little money, maybe lower, even lower their electricity prices, even though China's got like the lowest prices in the world. I think that rooftop solar is going to boom in the United States, and especially amongst the business community, 
because what we're seeing is all kinds of innovations. A couple of years ago, I interviewed an entrepreneur in San Diego, and what he what, what he would do is he would go around to the various industrial parks and he would sell the the businesses there on this idea of a microgrid within the industrial park. And 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 his uh, pitch to them was, look, you're paying forty at at peak price, not all the time, but at peak price, you're paying forty. 50 cents uh, a kilowatt hour, it's killing you. So I'll install this microgrid at my expense. So that's solar panels, batteries, and the digital controls and all the wiring and, and so on to make it work. And uh, I'll get paid out of your savings. So it's kind of energy as a service. And you're seeing this pop up all over the place. And the other thing you're, you're seeing is the the companies saying, okay, look, we, we can get cheap panels and 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 uh, batteries and, and digital controls, and we'll hire a, an engineering company, or we'll do it ourselves, and we'll we'll integrate that into our operations, and so that we have again, you know, protection from uh, from outages, and also the opportunity to arbitrage if they into sell electricity into the grid if they can. I think that's going to be a much bigger than eight gigawatts a year of new capacity going forward. So here's the irony. Donald Trump becomes president, immediately declares war <clears throat> on, on renewable energy, installs Chris Wright as secretary of energy. And he he's, you know, like the, the, the general uh, in this particular war. And there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, they, they might slow it down, you know, fair enough. Uh, but they can't stop it. And they can't even come close to stopping it. There's simply too much demand uh, too much momentum to that demand, and too many other sources of load coming on to the to the power grids like AI centers to stop. And the executives, I've heard them say, the only option we have is solar and batteries and, and a little bit of wind. Uh, and that's the only option we have. And so we're going to go for it, even if it costs more, because the, the uh, there's a, a very high uh, tariff on Chinese solar panels. And uh, the Chinese are like a quarter of, of what it costs the Americans uh, to manufacture. Uh, but the Americans are building capacity. They now have 13 gigawatts a year of manufacturing capacity. So, you know, they're catching up. They use 38, but they've got 13, you know, and they're building, they're building more. The market is going to, to drive this now, as opposed to policy as it did under, under the Biden administration. And uh, yeah, in the short term, there's going to be higher prices. And as I, energy economist Ed Hurst from the University of Houston told me in an inter interview uh, last week or the week before, I asked him who's going to pay. And he said the customers, the rate payers. That's just the way it's going to go. And then that high prices will then stimulate more self-generation and more demand management and so on. So there's a real revolution going on in the U.S. power sector. Lots of anxiety lots of change. And it's a fascinating to watch how the market and the utilities and consumers all react to those different pressures and price signals. Now, the lesson for Canada is that change is coming. Now, the BC Hydro, for example, thinks its only growth is only going to be 2%. And they may be right. But we're going to see higher than that in other places because we will electrify our economy and we will, you know, electric vehicles and electric, and, excuse me, industrial processes and so on. Where are we going to get the power? Building hydro dams is very expensive. Uh, Ontario is really in a little bit in New Brunswick, the only ones that have got uh, nukes. Uh, so we got to get it from someplace. BC Hydro, I think, is going to be the model because they've got pur power purchase agreements out to indigenous communities and others, you know, to for wind, solar uh, power and some batteries. So that that combined with hydro, I think, in, at least in the short term, we're going to see a lot more of it. But we need a lot more. We need to plan for that because electrification is coming. And the Americans are like the canary in the in the mine shaft. If you don't prepare, if you don't modernize your grid, you don't make investments in new generating capacity, you get caught get caught shorts, you know, like the old saying about we, when the tide goes out, we see who's been swimming naked. The Americans have. But can, Canada shouldn't be smug. It could happen to us too. So this is a story that we're going to watch at Energy Media. We'll be 
we'll be reporting on it on a regular basis. Uh, please give me your comments in the comments section. Any feedback uh, that you have, I'm, you know, this is a complex story. So if you've got any insights, maybe you've got some expertise, feel free to share it.